All right, anyway, she's a former US Digital Service employee. She is the runner of engineering teams at a startup called Rebellion Defense. She is the first of her name, and we welcome Marianne Bellotti. Hello, DC. How is everybody this morning? Good, glad to hear it, glad to hear it. It's great to be back at DevOps Day DC. So, as already introduced, my name is Marianne Bellotti. I wrote a book called Kill It With Fire, which is basically about really, really old computer systems and how to restore them to operational excellence, which is something that I did a lot of when I was working in the federal government. Um, I've got about 20 years of software experience, give or take, depending on how, whether or not you count me hacking at the age of 13 or not. I'm not anymore for my professional uh, resume, but like some people do. And um, the things that I really get interested in are really complex systems, how they fail, how we architect them, um, formal methods progressively more and more. Uh, I currently run engineering teams at Rebellion Defense. I have a hard time figuring out what my title is supposed to be at Rebellion Defense because it's a small startup, so my job title changes about every three to four months. So I just kind of leave it at that, like I run engineering teams. And as the name would suggest, I work in the defense industry right now. And since I work in the defense industry right now, when I'm out and about in the tech community, people tend to come up to me and go, why do you want to work on killer robots? And that makes me very sad because, first of all, that's not at all what I do. And this is a DC crowd, so I know you guys are a little bit ahead of the curve in what I'm going to say here. You probably have interacted with some government technology a bit in your careers. A lot of what I'm working on are old computers. The DoD in particular, I, I like this fact, they had to actually issue an order to get everyone to upgrade to Windows 10. And it took them two years to do it because some of their computers were so old they couldn't be on Windows 10. It was only in like 2018 that they were like, yeah, we think we almost got it. We almost got it done. Effectively, it's done. So kudos to any of you if you were involved in like that whole escapade. But that's a great example of like what we're really dealing with when we're working with inside, inside the government. Um, we're also dealing with bad networks, low connectivity. We deploy all over the world, and so like we're not necessarily dealing with like a nice office building down in DC when we're talking about running technology. Sometimes we're talking about environments where there really is no telecommunications infrastructure at all. And when people talk to me about my job and the consequences of my job, the thing that I say to them is like, my biggest concern is getting the DoD to stop storing data in PowerPoint files. Oh. And usually at that point they go, you mean Excel files, right? And I'm like, no, I mean PowerPoint. I mean, like, they put their data in PowerPoint slides and then send it to their leadership and then they throw the rest of the data away and then we have to get it out of the PowerPoint file. <laughs> So these are the kind of things that I, we're really doing and we're really working on solutions for. It's not like killer robots and like sentient AI and things like that. But this talk is not about how great it is to work at defense, so don't worry. Um, if you have complicated feelings about it, I also have complicated feelings about it, that's fine. And you should be worried about the software that I'm building. You should also be worried about the software that you're building. This is a, a talk about safety. And the thing that I find really funny about safety in software is that the things that tech people have concerns about safety are things like this. These are the things that people want to talk about when we talk about safety. They want to talk about killer robots. They want to talk about dorm thrones that are going to follow them home. Um, they want to talk about spying smart home devices, deep fakes. Uh, this thing that, that I didn't really know about until recently called smart dust, which are basically like nanocomputers that can like integrate into your body and all sorts of fun things like that. Uh, so a new thing to be scared of. And then like quantum computing. This is what being, being the topics that people gravitate towards when, when you bring up safety. But these are the things that actually go wrong that really seriously affect people's lives. Um, like disruption of healthcare systems and like the old insecure computer systems that are buried in our hospitals. Um, the, all the transportation chaos that is caused both by the systems that do flight control and logistics and also the computer systems that we physically put on our uh, transportation. Um, and then like the banking system is just basically a disaster zone of computing problems, right? People's money is missing from their accounts. There was a great thing that happened in the UK where they were actually giving people access to each other's accounts because they decided to, to modernize their mainframe and that went very badly. So these are the things that actually threaten 
your life, your safety, your personal happiness and, and ability to like move forward in, in your career and your future. But these are not the things that people talk about when they want to talk about safety because these are boring systems that we think like, well, what could possibly go wrong with them? And I find that really interesting. Like, why are we concerned about, are we concerned about the right things? And if we're not concerned about the right things, why are we so like gravitate towards the wrong issues to be worried about? And so the thing that I try to emphasize with people is that the greatest threat to your safety isn't some doomsday technology with like the, the fancy Hollywood trailer behind it. It's the failure of normal technology that's everywhere. And particularly it's feedback loops on these normal pieces of technology. It's what happens when they scale. It's what happens when we integrate them in new and exciting ways. It's things like that. Context is very, very important when it comes to safety. And so many engineers, software engineers that I talk to, they don't think about safety because they actually don't believe that anything they could ever build or push to production would ever really have a safety outcome at all. And so if, if you uh, come to DevOps Day DC before, you might remember that I gave a talk a couple years ago called Interdisciplinary Engineering that talked in a very similar space about like how important it is the difference between like a good software engineer and a great one is really having more of an interdisciplinary sort of perspective, having a little bit more of social science to it. So this is my jam. I'm playing the hits tonight. All right, and what I like about defense is that defense is a context in which it's really easy for under, people to understand how safety is important. So it's a really great playground for people like me to experiment with ideas and like bring research to the table and see how it integrates the software engineering teams. And that is what attracted me to my current role, is trying to figure out like, well, if we want software engineers to think about safety, how do we make that happen? How do we open it up? So safety is important for everybody. And the purpose of this talk is to sort of sell you on the idea of like, this is something you should think about and you can think about today and kind of give you some feeling of how to start thinking about safety as you look at the software that you deal with. And so what's fun about safety is that when you think about safety, you end up building more interesting and more useful things. And you're really thinking about the integration of technology into the human experience. Um, and then like, you know, when you talk, start getting into some of the traditional aspects of software safety, formal verification, specification, requirement driven development, you end up finding bugs and design flaws before you spend a whole bunch of time building a system. So that's always really nice too. So as I referred to, there's kind of like a traditional view of safety within software and then a new view of safety that's been building momentum over the last 10, 20 years. And so the traditional view of safety is, is a bit security focused. It's really about specification, verification, aggressively testing our systems and like determining its probable failure, risk management. You've probably been through some of these frameworks before. All of that is great. But there's a, a new view and like new is kind of not the best term for it because this, this research has been going on since like uh, the, the early 19th century. So it's like new to software, but not new in general. It's very like it's been integrated really fully in industrial safety for a while. But this new view of safety is really more about ergonomics. Right? How people adapt to systems, how people adapt to technology, what the sociological impact of different changes on systems are, and like system dynamics, how do to systems behave and operate and feed into one another. And so more and more in software, we're starting to get exposure to these ideas and incorporated in the safety conversation, moving a little bit beyond that kind of verification style. And so the, the thing to understand about like that kind of new view of safety, that sort of ergonomics view of safety, is that sometimes our solutions to things make our problems much, much worse. I'm noticing that when we exported this to PDF, it did not do the emojis. So some of this talk is going to be much more interesting than I expected it to be. We're going to go with it. All right. So what I really like about safety science is that I am a person that really loves counterintuitive impacts on complex systems. That's what made me gravitate towards legacy modernization is you're dealing with really complex systems that sometimes behave in really irrational ways. And it's fun to be a detective and figure out why. And that's also what draws me to safety is that safety sort of helps us reason about those counterintuitive impacts. And so you ready for some examples? I don't know. Are you ready for some examples? Thank you. All right, here we go. So, smart engineers automate everything. 
Who has said something like that in this room? Yeah, I mean, it's a DevOps confer conference. You've all said something like this. Like, be lazy, be a good engineer, just automate it away. Yes. And in general, I think that that's a wise strategy. But here's some fun facts. So there's a, a wonderful paper. It's like my number one most cited paper these days called The Ironies of Automation. Has anybody heard of this paper before? I see some head nods, some hand raise. Excellent. I'm glad it's getting more traction in the software community. This paper was published in 1983. And you could read it today and just like maybe like find replace some things that say like manufacturing and replace it with like DevOps and people would be blown away. It reads like everyday software engineering today. And essentially what Bainbridge's uh, point was is that experts are experts on systems because they operate them. They have they, the experience they get through operation and seeing different edge cases is what builds their expertise. And when you automate that, then they lose that expertise gradually over time. And she was spending a lot of time talking about this idea of human supervision and what we now refer to as human in the loop. And that you automate it and you say like, no, don't worry, we'll have a human being, we'll have our expert here who will be watching the automation and they'll make sure the automation is doing the right thing. But over time, the human becomes incapable of actually supervising that automation because they've lost that expertise. And then the consequences of that is that it tends to make onboarding more difficult, and it also tends to make the complex, this system more complex and harder to reason about. So this is something we've known since like 1983. We've seen it in, like she was talking about the automation of manufacturing, but we've also seen it in software. We've seen it all over the place. And one thing that comes up a lot in the defense space is um, we have, we're processing a huge amount of sensor data. And so different types of sensors. And so all across the DOD, you'll find organizations that have this, this essential like three tier analyst system. And like the first tier of analyst is like the 18 year old enlisted kid who just generally doesn't have any college experience, maybe has a high school diploma, who has the worst job in the world. Like his or her job is to sit at a chair and watch, let's say, video for hours at a time and just make notes of like what's going on in the surveillance. It's like very clockwork orange. Like they don't make them do it eight hours a day. They are sensible enough to know that people can't just sit there all day nonstop watching video, but it is a legitimately terrible job. They're just making notes of like what they see in the video. And then they have the, the second tier of analysts. And the, the job of the second tier analyst is to take all of those notes and aggregate them into sort of themes. Like what's going on in Baghdad today, right? Locations and trends. And then they have the third tier analyst that takes all the trend data and sort of produces intelligence and insight and recommendations and strategy for the command. And so you'll see this pattern over and over and over and over in defense. The other pattern you'll see over and over in defense is somebody saying to a company like my company, hey, why don't we replace all of T1 with AI? We hear the computers can do this now. We just get rid of them all. We'll get rid of all of T tier one. It'll all be like computer vision. Everything will be better. And generally speaking, when somebody comes to, to my company, at least, and they pitch us on this solution, the first thing I say is like, OK, how do you hire your tier two analysts? And they go, what do you mean? I said, who are these people? Where do they come from? And they go, oh, well, they spend a year or two as a tier one analyst. And then we take the best of them. We promote them up to tier, tier two. Right? I'm like, cool. How do you hire your tier three analysts? And they go, well, they spend a couple years at tier two, and we take the best of them, we report them up to tier three. And I'm like, great. So if you replace all your tier one analysts with computers, how do you hire your tier two analysts? And then they go, uh, oh shit. So, <laughs> so this is what we're doing, talking about when we say like counterintuitive effects of systems. It is very natural to assume that the best way of increasing the efficiency of this system is to replace your tier one analysts with like technology. But by doing so, we're making every single stage of this process weaker and diminishing their expertise. And there are things that are being done on the second and third tier that computers can't do, right? We need that expertise. We need that insight. And so you can see these impacts in your world, too. I mean, how many people have been through an outage that was caused by a configuration change that seemed really fine until it got to production and then psh, everything went bananas and nobody knew why or could predict it? Does that happen to anybody here? Yeah, again, room full of DevOps. It's happened to everybody. 
Um, we also see that we have edge cases that trigger unexpected behavior as the system scales, because something that happened once in a thousand requests on one scale didn't seem to have any impacts at all, but now suddenly you're handling millions of requests per second, and it's happening way more often, it has way more impacts, right? And then the, my favorite question, what is monitoring your monitoring system? And then what is monitoring the thing that's monitoring your monitoring system? And so on and so forth, until you just go turtles all the way down. And then one that's specific to, to my uh, career path is that when I was at USGS, we would hire a lot from like the, the FANG, I forgot what the, the, the acronym is now that they've all changed their names, but you know what I mean, the, the Google, the Netflix, the Facebook, the really large, prestigious tech companies. We'd hire a lot of talent from those companies, and we'd hire some people that had been at those companies for a really, really long time, and they were truly exceptional software engineers and really, really brilliant uh, people. And like, without fail, about their second to third month, they would come into my office or somebody else's office and have a complete panic attack. Because they'd go like, Marion, you don't understand. Like at Google, all the tooling does everything for me. I don't know anything anymore. Like I can't, I can't do anything like this. And it was generally just that they weren't accustomed to whatever the open source equivalent of the tooling that they had at Google was. And so we'd talk them down and be like, you understand the concepts, it's fine. We'll be patient, don't worry about it. But we sort of see these things play out when people get used to having all of this tooling in front of them, they forget how things operate under the hood and then they get very anxious about it, right? So there is actually a great SRE, I don't know if DevOps Day and SRECon are rivals or whatever, but there is a great <laughs> SRECon talk specifically about this paper and its impact in software that gives many more examples than I have time for. So I highly recommend if you're interested in this particular component that you look up this talk about the ironies of automation, a comedy in three parts that was an SRECon uh, in 2019. This is another example. How can we optimize this system more? We should just optimize it more. That, how, what could possibly go wrong? And I think we understand the sort of the downside of premature optimization when we're talking about costs and workloads on engineers because we're, we're kind of indoctrinated into SLOs and like our error budgets and like do we, do we get any benefit from this optimization? But we don't always understand that we're, when we're talking about optimizing something in terms of adding functionality and making it more specific to more specific problems. And the general rule of thumb that I follow is that when you increase optimization, you tend to decrease resilience. And so why? Well, so there's this, a great book put MIT Press called Mismatch, which is in, in theory about inclusive design and accessibility. But there's something that this researcher says in this book that always stood out at me. She said that the, the key to accessibility isn't so much having technology for people with disabilities. It's about establishing multiple pathways to do the same thing that if you have multiple pathways to do the same thing, that if there's some blocker like you are visually or hearing impaired, you have a way of working around it to accomplish the same thing and therefore it is more accessible. But the thing about that, that that's, everybody benefits from that because a lot of times our ability to operate technology is influenced by our context. A blocker might not be that we have some sort of disability, our blocker might be that one of the dependent systems has gone down and we need another way to get into that box to change the configuration. So alternative pathways come in handy for everybody in helping systems become more resilient and giving us options to sort of mitigate how they fail. But that variation is often the first thing that we eliminate when we optimize things. So just as a general trend, when we start to optimize things, we start to lower their resilience over time. And so we're seeing in the defense industry, we're seeing this play out now in a really, I find it really interesting and I hope it does some good, but we're seeing it play out right now with the Ukraine. In peacetime, people love their special like high tech weaponry. Like they spend huge amounts of time going, give me the targeting system that has like the most bells and whistles on it, right? Like the absolute best thing. And people justify investing in these technologies by saying, well, you know what? This isn't for your everyday soldier. This is for the elite 
fighting forces that we are going to hand grow and like select from the best of the best and like raise up. But what's interesting about this for me is that all that gets thrown out of the window when there's an actual war because none of that is practical in an actual war. In an actual war, you need to take people who have no skills, who have maybe never been to a basic training uh, boot camp at all, let alone like operated in a war zone, and you need to get them prepped and out the door as quickly as possible. And this is what we're seeing going on in the Ukraine. Our biggest barrier to providing assistance to the fighters in the Ukraine is training. We have these incredibly complex, incredibly specific systems that we normally like train people for months at a time on how to operate. And we have to figure out how to ship them out to people who've never operated them before and get them to use it effectively. And so like this is a great example of how we've optimized, optimized to make more and more sophisticated systems. And we've lowered the resilience of them because they can only really be used by specific people in specific contexts. And war is not convenient in that way. But we can also see this in like the more conventional private sector, right? So my favorite example of this is COT solutions, like Salesforce and WordPress and, and things like that, that people tend to put into their systems and then modify in all sorts of ways with plugins and extensions to try to get them to do something that they really weren't intended to do. And like sometimes that works, but like again, this crowd knows it. It introduces all sorts of fun security holes. It tends to in introduce both dead code and junk code, which affects performance. And um, often we don't really actually back up those modifications in a real way. We end up with these artisanally corrected systems that like do things. So. That's one example of this at play, but another example is market adjustments. When you are, are specializing the features to appeal to a smaller and smaller or more specific group of people and more specific use cases, like things change, cultures change. And we see that happening with technology where like Facebook started losing out to Twitter until they changed their newsfeed uh, flow to sort of match a shorter updates. And like Instagram is constantly fighting with TikTok now. And like this is the way that like when we chart to optimize, we start to lose our resilience, we start to lose our ability to sort of adjust to change. Cool. This is a particular favorite of mine because I hear it like three times a day, every day these days. Computers will remove human error. So we're going to get rid of the human error and that's what technology is going to do for us. It's going to be great. Everything's going to be so much better because the computer is so much smarter than the person. So. What I think is really important to understand about the concept of human error that we don't talk about very much in technology is that human error actually has a sociological function, right? When something goes wrong, it's not just that people need something, someone to blame. It's like part of the grieving process, part of the closure process is the, the idea that someone has been held accountable for this, that this will not happen again because we found the person whose fault it was, we have identified them as ad fault, and we've made them feel really bad about it or punished them in some way, and therefore that will save us from this happening in the future. And so um, one of my favorite researchers in the safety space, who I'll talk about a little bit more and kind of give you some recommendations on, is this guy by the name of Sidney Decker. And he did a whole research on like, how people really perceive blame. Like he's done a lot of work on like how blame works in organizations and like the sociological function of it. And one of the things he kind of pushes is that in an incident, you can always find a human somewhere that made a mistake, right? And in fact, most of those mistakes happen when the system isn't failing either and it doesn't matter, right? So the, the process that we take in, in post-mortems of like drilling down and drilling down and drilling down can be misused to just identify a human to blame for the mistake. Like if we can't find anything in the operator's behavior that was wrong, then we can ask like, well, who was in charge of the maintenance of this technology? Did they do anything wrong? If you can't find anything wrong there, we can go, who manufactured this technology? Did they do anything wrong? If we can't find anything, we can just keep going down levels and levels and levels until there is some human who has done, who made some decision that's like slightly off what the manual said, and then we can go, up oh, human error. So this is really kind of like the wrong emphasis for a lot of these things. Um, there's this really interesting concept called Kasparov's Law, uh, named after the chess player, 
who spent a lot of time after, I think he lost, after he lost to Deep Blue, not after like the, the rounds of it, uh, kind of looking at like how humans paired with machines played against each other and against other humans or just machines alone. And he came to the conclusion that a human with a machine was more likely to beat both the machine and the chess master and the expert. But the thing that sometimes is lost from the conversation around Kasparov's law is that it was only when they had a very specific relationship to one another. What tended to happen when they put experts with the machines is that the experts tended to go to the machine, all right, what should my next move be? And then look at it and go, ha, I don't like that move, whatever, machine's stupid, I'm just gonna do what I want. Or they do the exact opposite. They just like wholesale do whatever the machine wanted without like really thinking about the consequence of the move. This wasn't what amateurs did when they were given these uh, chess playing computers. What they did is they said to the computer, this is the move I wanna make. What's the counter move that my opponent might make? And then getting a wide variety of different counter moves and like using that information to sort of think more critically about the initial move that they were going to make. And so often you'll see people describe this scenario as like dumb human plus computer is superior to expert. And I really don't like calling it that because that seems to suggest that like humans are dumb and computers are smart. But really it is about the, the nature of that relationship between the computer and the machine and like how you partner them together. People are always going to alter their use of technology so that they can blame the technology when failure happens if you give them the opportunity to do that. So one of the big things to do in safety is to think about how that relationship is negotiated. Like if you were the operator and something was gonna go wrong, how would you blame the machine? And like how, how have you created that, that relationship between them? Um, some ways they do that is by fully delegating the decision to the machine. So if you're familiar with the, the sentencing recommendation algorithm that caused all this problems a couple years ago, that's basically what we're seeing. That, the people who designed that technology did not think the people were just gonna wholesale rubber stamp those sentencing recommendations, but that's exactly what happened because nobody wanted to be blamed for a bad outcome, so they just fully delegated to the machine. Um, and then the other thing that people do is like use the technology in unapproved ways. And if you've watched uh, the Elon Musk crash course documentary, you've seen sort of just like a master class in that. It doesn't matter what Elon Musk says autopilot is for. It doesn't matter what Tesla says that autopilot is for. People are gonna push the boundaries of it, even when it means that they're risking their own lives. So one of the examples I love to give about two people about the, the options that you have in negotiating the partnership between computers and machines is very simple. It's the difference between spell check and autocorrect. I assume we're familiar with both of these things. We interact with them every day. And what's wonderful about spell check is when it's right, you're grateful for it being right. When it's wrong, you just ignore it. It doesn't influence you at all. And it's impossible to passively delegate to, to spell check. You have to actually like hover over the little like squiggly line and say like, oh yes, this is misspelled, this is the correct spelling, right? Autocorrect is a different thing, isn't it? When it's right, you don't notice because often you didn't realize that you mistyped it or misspelled it in the first place. When it's wrong, it's confusing and it's irritating as hell. And you have to proactively override it. At the end of the day, these two features are fundamentally the same technology and the same style of algorithms. The difference is the relationship that they're setting up between the human and the machine. One is like very proactively kind of managing you and the other is like prompting you, prompting your critical thinking skills. And so we have a pleasant experience and we're grateful for spell check and everyone hates ducking uh, autocorrect. Okay, so this is kind of more like a thing I hear from managers in like the C-suite uh, than I hear from engineers, but we're gonna go for it anyway. This system is unstable because our engineers aren't good enough. And all we gotta do is just hire better engineers. Has anybody seen this chart before? Okay, so this is a big thing in safety research. It's the operations gradient. And essentially it has uh, three three curving axes, the economic failure of the company, 
the unacceptable workload on the workers, and the functionally acceptable performance of the system, it being a manufacturing system, which is where it comes from, but it can also be a computer system. And what this researcher was talking about is that we're pushing out all the time within organizations. And at every stage of an organization's life, it is coming very, very, very close to the edge of one of these boundaries. And if it goes over the boundary, it will trigger a failure. If it goes over the economic boundary, the company will go bankrupt. If it goes over the unacceptable workload boundary, then people will burn out and quit. If it goes after the functional acceptable performance boundary, then the system will crash. But it's always, the system is always in a state of near failure because these, these, these factors are pushing against one another at all time. And so I think this is something that really resonates with DevOps people. Like the system is always on the verge of failure no matter what. It doesn't really matter how smart you are or how well automated your systems are. It's always going to be on the edge of failure or like approaching there. So having thrown out those examples and connected them to real world, if you're interested in sort of digging into this in more depth and like learning more about the research, how do you get there? So these are sort of the best uh, examples I give people from the conventional world of safety science. There's Sidney Decker, who I mentioned before. He's got a number of books. They're all wonderful. They all provide an excellent overview of all the researchers and like the decades of studies that have been done. The one that tends to be the most accessible to DevOps and SRE types is called the Field Guide to Understanding Human Error. I also really like Drift into Failure. He, he's an excellent writer. It's an academic work, but it's very accessible and very easy to read. So that's a good place to get started. The other one that's really fun is this researcher by the name of Charles Perot. Has anyone heard of Charles Perot here? Eh, some hands. He's very popular. This book, this cover looks really cute. This book I refer to as the Harry Potter of Incident Reports. It is huge, thick tome of studies of all sorts of incidents from everything from nuclear accidents to oil rigs blowing up to transportation accidents. And he goes through and he kind of analyzes all of these different incidences and draws some insights around how systems behave. And specifically, he's known for the idea of you have coupling and complexity and you need to get the ratio right of these two things because otherwise you will trigger failure. And then there's Nancy Livingston, who actually specifically talks about software engineering. So she's the one that's most directly connected to our world and how we think about software and software integration. And so her book is also really great. And like you have the opportunity to see your talk, it's also really cool. And then there are some supporting topics that I think are broadly useful. Um, in this space as well. The whole system dynamics community is more policy connected than it is uh, technically correct connected, but its heritage is in cybernetics and this uh, applied math uh, that basically led into computer science. So there's some really interesting ideas about control systems in uh, Dana Meadows' work. And it's also another really accessible book that's easy to read. I, I've spent a lot more time progressively around network theory and contagion theory because I'm really interested in particular how organizations kind of absorb knowledge and spread it. And so I've, I've found the work of social network researchers, not people who research Facebook necessarily, but people who are literally looking at like how people are connected together and how they spread information to be really interesting. Um, and then of course there's a great set of books that are specifically about, hey, what are all the disasters we can find with computers and like writing about them in depth. And I always find it really fun to just sort of flip through that for inspiration and to think about like what has gone wrong in the past and what we might see go wrong in the future. So that concludes my talk. I hope it was enjoyable and amusing. Um, you can follow me on Twitter and basically all the social networks under the handle Belmar. Uh, really appreciate you giving me the option to talk to you guys today and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs> well done. Thank Thanks. you so much, Marianne.